I've been playing Stella Deus, The Gate of Eternity, because you have no time to gay. Now, here we have an interesting game. One set in pre, or is it post-apocalyptic world? I'm not sure. Maybe it's neither, as the apocalypse is kind of currently ongoing, just very slowly. But the effects are very much being felt by the inhabitants. This isn't a Fallout style nuclear blast or some wow sort of retcon world ending thing. The world is dying and so are its people. What set it apart even more is the fact it's very much a fantasy world, albeit with a JRPG kind of science fantasy elements in the theming with like alchemical creations and whatnot. This slow death of a world sets an interesting theme for the game, one in which many have lost all hope and those that are clinging on don't seem to hold much stock in saving anything, they just want to live. I mean, the big bad guy, who has the amazing name of Dignus, just wants to go to the end with a big bang, as opposed to giving into the apathy or acceptance that the main religion, the Aquae, are touting. The Aquae believe that God wants us to have a peaceful end, and so they just give in to the idea of not resisting the end. We do have a third group though, involving Avis, a prince of a dead kingdom, Linnea, a shaman of the people of Anima, who all take part in a resistance against Dignus's war machine. So unlike the Aque, they're not giving in. In fact, they're looking for a way to save the world. They're the only people that are. I mean, Dignus has a guy looking into the same thing via alchemy, but he doesn't seem to really trust that he has much chance in succeeding. But as Spiro, our lead, says, all these are just different forms of dealing with the trauma of, of this dying world. And each are equally valid in their own ways, but for him personally, he simply refuses to just let the world die. And so he joins the third group, the ones trying to save the world. And it makes sense, it's a game. What else are we gonna do apart from save the world? So this dying world of Solemn is our setting. And it's a theme that permeates throughout the game. The wash light coloring is used throughout the game and which actually gives quite a varied map design. A map design that still manages to keep the theme, which is quite a feat as many games rely on using multiple biomes to provide variety. This game map sticks to the theme of the world turning lifeless with broken ruins, desert, and even the occasional oasis. But by using clever multiple level terrain, a variety of different battle settings. The character art also goes along with the map design with the keeping in the same sort of theme. And it's actually done by some of the artists responsible for Persona 3 on onwards, I believe. This also seems to stick on point with many of the characters wearing lighter armour, well, the main cast at least, or skewing armour altogether. Because I get the feeling it's rather warm as everything's kind of deserty. The overall design ties together really nicely when it's all said and done. It managed to get its ideas and themes across with visual cues as well as storytelling. Anyway, that's kind of the basic background for the main plot. The main plot that sees Spiro and his band of merry men and women, who are first part of Dignus's war machine, albeit in Spiro's case, more because of circumstances than choice, as his friend and older, and older brother figure, is the alchemist that's trying to save the world that Dignus hires. But anyway, to help Visor, the older brother alchemist guy, they go out killing the native creature called a spirit. A strange little being that's by sucking up its very essence, you can use that essence to power alchemical devices. But it isn't before long that Spiro learns that by killing the spirits, they are spreading this dreaded miasma, the world ending apocalypse that's happening. And it's eating the world faster and faster because they're killing the spirits. So the miasma is kind of like um, a fog that's spreading out from some unknown source that slowly destroys everything and turns it into nothing, effectively. Just desert and death. Anyway, after a fateful encounter with Linnea, the shaman, he begins a new and the true journey to open something called the Gate of Eternity, an ancient shaman device that will flood the world with spirits once more and reinvigorate it. So yeah, that's the story. But anyway, I, it's a PS2 game. It took me roughly about 40 hours to see the credits roll. And it was released by Atlas on October the 28th, 2004 in Japan, and a little bit later in the West. 
So, as it's a game, it has gameplay. Stellar Deus plays a lot like many classical tactical RPGs. But first, outside of battle, we have an interconnected world map that we navigate via dot marks or nodes or whatever you want to call them. A date system that counts for every node we move. This date system is linked to side quests, some of which happen at specific times of year or month, and some which have time limit to complete. Outside of the battle markers, we can visit towns in which we can buy equipment, take on side quests, or enter the catacombs. The side quests range from battle events, which usually have a little bit of story around them, or events where you need like a specific stat on a specific character to be high enough to complete, otherwise you fail. And they're mostly for monetary rewards or you know experience from partaking in the battles. Also, as well as buying equipment in town, we have a crafting system. And well, this is not a positive affair. It's massively clunky, and you basically need a guide open to use it effectively. The idea is simple. You combine any two items and it produces a third. But you have no tracker or like menu of items you've created that you can click to recreate or anything like that. So beyond writing down the combinations yourself on a notepad or using a guide, in game, you basically have no way of tracking what does what. And it's, yeah, it's long winded. It's not very effective. And on top of that, you can't buy items that you need in the craft MD. You have to back out, go into the shop, buy the items, back out, go back into the, the crafting menu. It's just very slow and clunky. But the most powerful weapons and skills you can craft are locked behind this system and many of them you need because you need to craft the skills you even need to craft um, job progression items as well and you need to know how to do this and it's all locked behind this crafting system but yeah it's just slow and clunky unfortunately I also said there were some catacombs this is like a hundred level dungeon basically each level is a battle that's the enemies are the level of the battle of the the enemies are the level of whatever level of the dungeon you're going into so if you're going to level three the enemies will be level three and it's a simple battle you can get some good items from winning it and xp obviously for taking part in the battle and this is the method to grind in the game if you need to but it's it's a simpler tick affair and you'll see some of the maps again and again and again like it's it's quite repetitive and the enemy types are a bit mixed up each time you go in there. You can also sort out your characters while you're in the town. So you have all the normal things like equipping them, um, checking their class progression, so step, getting them to like level up to the next class type on a predefined route. Each character has a set series of progressions they have. And, and you can also organise your skills, of which you have a limited amount of. So it's divided into like attack skills and various buffs so you've got a limited number of attack skills you can take which can involve your special attacks healing spells that sort of stuff or the the other option is the buffs and resistances which are incredibly important as having the correct like status effect resistance for a map can be a matter of life and death and then you have a control like an area of effect ability as well you can assign that affects what happens in your control area. There's also an option to upgrade your actual stat points for using the same things you use to unlock skills, which is your like stat points. Which you can also use your stat points to upgrade your actual stats, but this isn't really something I felt was needed at all. I think I used it once just so someone could hit the like stat requirement to get their next job upgrade. So anyway, now that we've done everything in town, we want to have a battle, so how does this go down? Well, this is a classic square grid system with turn order being based on speed and action point availability. On your character's turn, you get a set of action points, up to 100, to spend on movements and actions. The further you move, the more action points it costs, and obviously different skills and attacks, etc., item usage, special abilities, have a different amount of action points they cost as well, as well as costing like MP on top as well. Or stamina or whatever it's called in this game. <laughs> this action point system 
means it's actually quite flexible in what you can do. Yeah, it's actually, this action point system means it's very flexible in what you can do in a turn for each character. And as stated, how many action points you have left over determines somewhat where you're gonna, when you're going to act next. So if you have more left over, you're more likely to get another turn sooner. So actually attacking the enemy works how you'd expect with side and back attacks being more effective. Every ability having an area of effect with hitting from hitting from one square to a large diamond, uh, along with characters, as I said previously, having a control area with abilities that cause various effects while the enemies or allies are in that control area. And so every character has like a set size of control area as well. Some of them are straight lines, some of them are like diamonds around them. It just depends on the character. And if you have multiple people, it's a control area covering a single enemy, you can unleash team attacks as long as the party members have enough team attack usages left. The usage of such team attacks and the massive damage they cause is very important in dealing with enemies effectively. But beware, as well as you having these control areas and team attacks, the enemy can also do this, and they have some brutal control effects, including status effects and such. So I feel I need to talk about the leveling, as it does follow the classic, the character that acts earns some XP. So I feel we need to talk about the leveling, as it does follow the classic, the character that acts and spec B for whatever it is they did. But this leads us to a funny little technique which is more relevant in this game than even many of its contemporaries that have a similar mechanic. This being the use of healing to level. We see this in games such as Shining Force where every time a healer casts a heal spell they get XP. Usually a small amount even if the target is at full health. And it's usually used to mitigate the fact that your healer ain't going to be killing much. Now, Stella Deus, because of the skill mechanic, where you can use the crafting system to make scrolls and then, you know, give those to any character, well, every character can get a heal. And you get more XP for using a heal on an ally that's a higher level. And it's not like an insignificant bump. It can be like a quarter of what you need sometimes to level up. So you get to the situation where everyone's just kind of spamming heal on the highest level ally as it's the most effective way of leveling, even more so than, you know, hitting and killing enemies. So pretty much every character that has a downturn will just heal one of the others. So yeah, heal and get spammed a lot. The last bit about gameplay I wanted to mention was that you have quite a variety in the maps. It doesn't really suffer from the dreaded mapitis for the most part. Mapitis being a condition where a game suffers from poor map design, with features such as heavy terrain, slowing movement to a crawl, or where enemies start a uh, half a mile away, requires 15 minutes of movement to get there. Nope, most of the maps are actually well designed and quick to get into the engagement. Obviously there's the occasional dud, but it's more heavily weighted on the good side. So what is actually good about this game? Well, the story and the theme are a bit different to normal, and I find it surprisingly enjoyable. And the gameplay is very solid, proving a lot of proving to have a lot of tactical depth, especially if you don't overgrind with the catacombs. It all blends together to create a deep and enjoyable tactical experience. And obviously every game isn't perfect, well no game is perfect. And as I previously stated, the crafting system is a very poor example of such a style of system. The enemy variety as well is a little lacking, as you'll be seeing the same models used again and again and again. And there's also a bit of a chunk of the story in the middle that could have just been cut out, that slowed the game to a bit of a crawl at that point. But yeah, before my final thoughts, what did the critics think? Well, it's called OK from the critics, a 75 on Metacritic, but the users seem to enjoy it a little bit more than the critics, giving it an 8.4, so an 84. So yeah, not bad all round, it seemed to be well liked. Now, my final thoughts are that it's a very solid tactical RPG in both story and gameplay, with a unique visual style that I really enjoyed. It really expresses the themes of the games, and they had an interesting attempt at voice acting. Now, I've seen in other places where people trash on the voice acting, but I didn't think it was that bad. I've, I've heard worse. It, it, it was serviceable. The story really could have done some tightening up in the middle. I found that I 
really struggled once I hit the middle part a bit because it just slowed to a grind and you had to repeat the same story plot like four times and it just wasn't doing it to me so there was a little bit where I felt a bit burned out but yeah overall what like I said I started to felt a bit burned out that really hurt my motivation to try and carry on the gameplay did keep me coming back for more um, I even did a good chunk of the catacombs even though it's quite repetitive just for the sake of it other than leveling up I just wanted to do some battles sometimes but be aware this is not a small game by any means it has 51 main battles and then the catacombs on top of that all the actual side missions you're probably going to do 100 plus battles on a normal playthrough not like a complete trying to complete everything playthrough and these battles can range from 15 minutes to over an hour in some cases so yeah it's not it's not a small game so anyway my rating is give it a go